Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for September 6, 2023. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, please have a seat. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations, or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. All right, thank you. And uh, do we have a motion to amend Mr. tonight's agenda? Yeah, Mr. President, we move to amend the agenda to include a non-public tuition payment. We have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, approval of the minutes, uh, to, August 16th. Yeah, move to approve the closed session minutes from August 16th. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Move to approve the open session meetings from, minutes from August 16th. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, moving on to the fun stuff. Awards, Dr. Salas. Mm -hmm. Yes, the best part of the meeting. <laughs> Good evening. I'd like to kick off some of our awards and recognitions for this evening. The first award, this award is given to a staff member or volunteer who keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial, Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys, if they'll please come forward. And our nominator this evening, Mr. Kintop, if you'll please come forward. So our September Energizer Bunny is Christine Frederick. She'll please come forward. Yeah. She's not here yet. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. Oh, to okay. Well, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll circle back around to her. We'll move on to number two, which is also Kevin. So if, if we can just wait and have you guys wait, we'll come back up. Hopefully she'll be here any, any second. <laughs> our second award is our Queen Anne's County Public School Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. September's Spirit Award is Jennifer Dreyer. Yay. <laughs> Jen joined our summer programming this year as the site coordinator for the high school credit recovery program. As a teacher and a reading specialist at the middle school level, this opportunity to work with our high school program was a step out of her comfort zone. However, this is where she truly showed her spirit and dedication. Jen jumped right in, helped to coordinate over 200 students in an online recovery program. She coordinated laptops, kept attendance, and credit completion numbers, handled day-to-day -day operations and communications with families, all in an effort to help Queen Anne's County Public School students recover <coughs> credits and move closer to graduation. It is because of employees like Jen that when we refer to our students, we mean every child in every grade in every school. So thank you for your efforts with summer school. The next award is our Shining Star Award, and I'd like to call up Mrs. Jolene Smith as well. 
and it's actually a nomination on behalf of Mrs. Smith, Mr. Kintop, and the summer school team as a whole. And this award is presented to an individual in our school system who shines. And this award for September goes to Caitlin Jackson. <laughs> Caitlin provides instruction to a large group of students during our extended year program for this summer. She des designed engaging and rich lessons for our students needing the most support and structure. Caitlin showed a high level of knowledge for teaching students with complex needs, recognizing those needs, and with a combination of consistency and ongoing reinforcement, and all while meticulously keeping data. Caitlin was supported by a team of school assistants that were provided with guidance and support to maximize their impact on students as well. Ms. Jackson truly shines as a star this summer. We have one more recognition. I'd like to call up our supervisor, Mr. Michael Page, please. Supervisor of Science Instruction. So Queen Anne's County Public Schools has been recognized as the 2023 U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School for innovative efforts to reduce environmental impacts and costs, promote better health, and ensure effective sustainability in environmental education. Queen Anne's County Public School was nominated for this award by the Maryland State Department of Education. Nationwide in 2023, there were only 26 schools, 11 districts, and four post-secondary institutions that received this honor. It is a big deal. <laughs> this is a really, really big deal. As a matter of fact, I think we have the, um, the canvas that they gave us. I'm not sure, I think Mr. Pinder may have that. He can bring it out if he does. Um, so I, I just wanted to personally um, say to the board to give an extra special thank you to not only Mr. Page for his leadership, but for the entire staff in Queen Anne's County Public School for working hard to build a foundation for a sustainable future. I also want to um, ask Mr. Pinder to come up because in particular, his hard work, yeah, that was really good work, right? But really between the two of, um, between the two, Mr. Michael Page working with staff members in the schools as it relates to the environmental aspect of thing, creating those outdoor classrooms and things like that, but also Mr. Pinder and his work with our energy savings. So you put the two together and that's why we were successful with this award. Um, so recently, Mr. Page, he um, traveled to Washington, D.C. Um, to the United States Department of Education to participate in a ceremony that recognized Queen Anne's County Public Schools and he received this amazing plaque that's heavy <laughs> that's heavy so he received he, he received this on behalf of the Board of Education and we will be having these both in the main foyer as soon as you walk in the first thing you'll see um, when you enter um, Queen Anne's County Public Schools Central Office will be that this recognition to our public schools and so gentlemen I can't thank you enough for your leadership in that area and I'm very proud of that I mean and Queen Anne's County has been the lead literally um, across the state of Maryland for years with all of our schools being green schools. This year at every elementary school, we have a new outdoor classroom opportunity. Um, they look sharp, they're amazing. And, and, and it's not just for science. Those, are, those pavilions are, are used for all classes, can go out and um, take, a, take a nice breather outside and enjoy learning in the outside environment. So thank you and kudos to you all. without Kristen here, I'd still like to recognize her and at least read um, about her and then maybe we can. Um. So as the Energizer Bunny for September, <laughs> Chrissy wore, um, it's Chrissy Frederick as I had said before, Chrissy wore multiple hats 
for us this summer, and we could not be more grateful. In the morning, she led our Art and Nature Gears Camp program at Graysonville Elementary School. She helped students create unique and diverse works of art, braiding different facets of nature into each. And then when the camp students went home, Chrissy changed her hat and was the site coordinator for their after school PFY program at Graysonville Elementary School. In this role, she ensured that students lunch ran smoothly and then coordinated and rotated series of programs in the afternoon. Her willingness to take on both roles and her desire to see kids enjoying learning makes her an excellent example of an energizer bunny. So kudos to her and thank you for her efforts. Board involvement, the first thing I'm going to do this evening is introduce our new uh, student member, board members, Ms. Nay Fenn Sreary Forti, and Ms. Uh, Queen Ant uh, High School, and uh, Cody Sandifer of Ken Island High School. So they're gonna be joining us uh, at all the meetings for this year. They obviously represent their uh, respective high schools. We look forward to having them and hearing uh, what's going on in the high schools directly from high school students. And um, board members, would anybody like to be recognized? I just want to say welcome back, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> County Fair was fun last month. Fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. As well as, yeah, welcome back. And um, I loved meeting all the new teachers, uh, the brand new teachers. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, I love that we have 60 new teachers, lots of wealth of, inf of uh, depth of teaching experience and a lot of them. Um, so I went to seven schools on the back to school the first day. Oh my goodness, so much fun. The, the sidewalk chalk, the balloons, the signs, the enthusiasm, the hats. It was a lot of fun to see. So um, welcome back. I hope, I'm sure it's gonna be a fantastic year. Yeah, I also attended several middle school open house. A lot of spirit there. Like, it's mm -hmm. fun to see the kids back. I mean, it's and it's, you know, we're back. You know, back pre COVID, back to COVID, okay. not to COVID any longer. I mean, kids are really out there in the air. Also, I had an opportunity. Was asked to meet with Dr. Copperfield, Chesapeake College, um, 20, 25 years ago. The board, current one of the boards looked into magnet schools, and. Uh, there was some discussion there, but it led on to other things about CTE partnerships. And I was very impressed with what, you know, we had to offer and what we're doing compared to other counties and things like that. Uh, we have a good program and I think Chesapeake College is a great asset to enhance our CTE programs. But the one thing I'd like to challenge this board doing is <clears throat> shortly, not shortly, in, in months, we'll be moving into a new board office. This building is historical. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not gonna be torn down parts can be. I think we should really look into possibly using this as a CTE program mm. to in increase our CTE programs, free up some space in our high schools. Um, it would give us a great opportunity. And I just think this board in the future, as we move forward, should look into that as a, as a possibility. I know there's a lot of things that have to be looked at, but my personal opinion, it could be a very good fit. All right. Thank you. So I uh, attended the new teacher breakfast uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as Ms. Bennett mentioned, we have, what, 62, 68 teachers? About 60, yeah. yeah, about that. Brand new to the school system. Uh, a handful are brand new to teaching, and uh, one of them is actually a, uh, one of our former graduates from 2012, so that's always uh, nice news to hear. And uh, I'd also like to mention that we're 98% capacity uh, in the time of a teacher shortage, na shortage nationwide. Um, we're up at 99% for teachers, 98% as the whole staff. So I think that really reflects uh, on a couple of people. Number one, the superintendent, uh, Mr. Noel and his team, and everybody else that's been involved in, uh, in recruiting effort um, for the past couple of years, actually, to get to this point. It also says a lot about the community uh, and the school system itself as well. It, it's a great community. It's an uh, excellent school system uh, to work in, and I, I'm glad to welcome all those teachers. I also attended the kickoff meeting, which was uh, several hundred people, and uh, from all 
invited from all areas in the school system. And uh, the uh, amount of energy and enthusiasm uh, in that auditorium, uh, you know, they say that education is, is not just pouring uh, information and facts and figures into a bucket. It's actually starting a fire, you know, desire to have a lifelong uh, learning. And I think just based on the enthusiasm and the excitement that I saw from the teachers and staff that day, we're going to be smoking it this year. Mm -hmm. So looking forward to that. Uh, I introduced the new school representatives. Um, usually at this point, if you guys want to um, put out any information, this would be your time. Um, you don't have to tonight, tonight, but if you've got something prepared or something you'd like to say and introduce yourselves, the floor is yours. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nathan, but I go by Nay, and I'm a senior at Queen Anne's County High School. And this month we have a lot going on. Um, on September 7th and 8th, we have our underclassmen picture day. September 14th, we are starting a new club. It's called Living Naturally High. And it's basically just a philosophy that you can live your life without substances and still have fun. So you don't have to like drink or smoke or anything to still have a good time. And September 18th and 19th, we have our senior portraits um, in the auditorium. And also on the 19th, the League of Women Voters will have a table set up outside the cafeteria to help students register to vote. Um, and the week of September 25th is our homecoming and our homecoming spirit week. Uh, Thursday the 28th at 5.30 p.m. we have our powder puff football game. Friday the 29th we have our homecoming dance at 6 p.m. Um, Saturday the 30th at 10 a.m. we have our homecoming parade and it's followed by the football game against North Carolina High School with a 12 p.m. kickoff. And September 29th our interim reports will be sent home, which marks the halfway point of the first marking period, which is crazy because we just started school. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we have going on this month at Queen Anne's County High School. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Cody Sandifer, and I'm the new student member of the board for Canal High School. Uh, we have had a very busy summer and the first week at Canal High School. This summer, our school got a brand new Buccaneer Blue roof. Uh, we also cleaned up our ponds on campus, which makes everything look much nicer and also opens up new opportunities for uh, classes and clubs and things like that. Uh, the last big change over the summer is the addition of the new portables. So our new portables finally allow all freshmen to be at KI full time and we have closed down the annex we had at the middle school. Um, for like this, since school started, our football team won this past Saturday against Parkside. And during this first week, we have also reviewed our spectator expectations which kind of gives guidelines of how our spectators should act at school events. And um, we went over our school safety procedures and had our first fire drill. Uh, tonight, there is a family workshop taking place. And this family workshop um, it has a bunch of food trucks. And the purpose of it is to help parents learn um, how to help their students succeed, like in school and in life. Uh, this week, we are very excited for our senior sunrise event which gets all the seniors together to watch the sunrise and we all get to hang out and eat breakfast before school and kind of just like introduce each other. And I look forward to meeting and uh, working with you all throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Good job, thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Salins. It was just a great kickoff. Um, I was able to get to all the schools, um, half of them the first day, half the second day, and then even had to just go back because our littles came in on the third day and I just couldn't resist. But, um, but it, it was smooth sailing and uh, thank you to all of the staff who made that happen because that doesn't just happen, it happens with a lot of hard work and a lot of planning. So um, a great kickoff and we're, we're out for the races, you know, mm -hmm. we're doing it. So it's great, thank you. Excellent, of course. Okay, moving on to citizen participation, public comment. Um, okay, Ms. Beck, yep. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, include their name, telephone number, and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First on the list, Cecilia Mitchell. <coughs> Thank 
Good, Good evening. evening. I'm Cecilia Mitchell. I'm the president of QACEA, and I'm here to share an email that we sent to Dr. Salins, President, President Schifanelli, my goodness, and Dr. Knoll. Um, it's with regard to action item 807, the Time to Care Act. In review of your agenda for tonight's meeting, we noted that there is a proposal to join the MABE MAKO Time to Care Act Collaborative. Please be mindful of the board's statutory obligation to negotiate all leave provisions, a mandatory subject of bargaining. With the designated exclusive bargaining representatives, inasmuch this proposed collaborative may not usurp the board's statutory obligations under the collective. Um, so I lost my place. Exclusive bargaining representative, oh, I'm a good, under the collective bargaining law. Finally, we also believe that this action is premature as the Time to Care Act regulations are not expected until January 2024, which will provide the necessary guidance to employers in creating an exempt, exempt plan. The association remains ready to engage in negotiations on this very topic. Thank you for your consideration. And it's signed by Christy Anderson, the general counsel for MSEA, and me as the president of QACEA. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Chris Blanton. Hello, Chris Blanton, Church Hill. Um, I've been to and spoken at numerous Board of Education meetings over the last few years. During COVID, parents wanted their kids back in school while the Board of Education men members and superintendent continued to do everything but listen to the parents, voters, and taxpayers. Since there, there's four new board members and a new superintendent. Fifth board member ran unopposed, therefore basically getting elected by default. You would think that this statement alone would be enough for the newly elected members and superintendent to do an about face from the previous board's decisions and mismanagement and listen to your constituents and make decisions based off the platforms that you all ran on, the children, unless that was a lie and you only did it to get elected. I have spoken during public comment on school safety and how our schools need to ensure that more money from your already robust budget be focused on infrastructure for safety in the schools. These statements have been met with resistance as it appears that this board has moved back into business as usual while continuing to make children last. During the open session, a citizen asked a question that related to a matter of school policy. The board refused to answer, stating that they did not answer questions. When I questioned the statement based off the rules set forth by the board, I was told that this is just a comment section and that it was not meant for questions, even though when you state the rules prior to each public comment sections, which stated questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over the which the board has authority. Someone has since changed that wording effectively striking the word questions. I'm curious to why the board doesn't want to answer questions on the record. <clears throat> that being said, I have asked numerous questions during public comment and I have also emailed the entire board questions to include the superintendent, Ms. Salins. Guess how many responses I've received? One, thank you, Ms. Capes. So you don't answer questions during public comment. You don't answer questions when they're emailed to you. Why, why do you answer, when do you answer questions? When someone calls in, so it's off the record? There in the open section, a group of people spoke uh, on the problem with books within Queen Anne's County Public Schools. The board was quick in that matter to stop the speaker and say that you should hold a work session on that matter. Funny story, I don't see you having a work session on school safety or this ridiculous expensive new Board of Education building. Just out of curiosity, I posted the Board of Education's plans to spend $20 million on a new board building while there are schools without running water, roofs that need to be replaced, and security infrastructure that, is, that was needed. No one said they were in favor of it. All questioned why. How does the new ivory tower benefit the kids in Queen Anne's County? The board is back to business as usual where you could clearly care less about the kids and your educators. Just because you're doing a dog and pony show every once in a while doesn't mean you care. You need to stop being self-serving and be community serving. Stop being part of the problem, be part of the solution. I can assure you focusing $20 million on a new board of education building is only self-serving and part of the problem. And before you say this was already in the works and approved before you took over, you all have the power to change this and refocus on what actually matters, the children and the future. I congratulate you on you getting your new 60 people your new 60 teachers, I guess they can all teach in, in modules because that's all we're going to have since we don't have room. Someone also said that this building Thanks, can, be, can be repurposed. Thank you. If it can be repurposed for you guys, why can't it be repurposed? Or for kids, why can't it be repurposed for you guys? All right. Thanks a lot. So am I going to get responses to my questions or? All right. Is there anybody next on the list? No, that was the last. All right. 
Okay, moving on. Uh, 6.01 summer project update, Mr. Pender. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, uh, Dr. Shalens, board members, executive team, student members. For the record, uh, my name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer for Queens County Public Schools. And with me, I have, thank you. Darrell Barraclow, Facility Planner. Good evening. <clears throat> so tonight we're here uh, before you to present uh, a lot of work that was done this summer and also a lot of work that uh, went on during the school year to get to these projects. Most of the projects are complete. Um, some are not. We're still finishing up. We ran into, you know, some supply chain issues um, and some items like that. So we just kind of wanted to go through. We had some pictures that we wanted to show. Um, um, you know, obviously we don't have pictures for every single project that uh, was accomplished. But at uh, Bayside Elementary School, we have the um, brand new metal seam roof that was installed. Um, we started that during the school year and finished it. Um, uh, probably middle of June or um, July. Um, that roof was from 1981, so I would say that uh, we got our money's worth from that roof um, on that project. We also, um, <clears throat> to keep on going with our food service department, we installed new condensers, evaporator units for the walk-in freezers and refrigerator. The uh, phone system there was from 1981 also, and we uh, upgraded that. By the way, a lot of these projects uh, we were able to fund through grants. Um, so the aging school program, we were able to um, install the new phone system um, and concrete sidewalks. We were able to use that through our MABE grant. Um, we try to use local contractors as much as we can. At Centerville Middle School, if you ride by there, we're not quite finished it, but we, um, have went through and painted um, all of the stucco on the outside, all the metal uh, door frames, window frames. And then when you go inside, we've done the same thing. Uh, painting that, we've also painted the block walls and all A, B, and C pod um, in the classrooms. One of our initiatives last year was to um, upgrade our, um, our short throw projectors and also our interactive boards to put those on a schedule like painting um, our building. So like every eight years uh, of going through that cycle, um, we were able to install 31 Epson bright link projectors. Um, another great project um, that we've realized, um, and some of these are good projects in partnership with the county commissioners because the cell phone booster project before, if you tried to use a cell phone or have any kind of communication inside of the school system or inside of Centerville Middle School, you were very, very limited. Um, that's something that we learned during our, some of our school safety drills. Um, so partnering with the county commissioners, we were able to get four schools um, done this summer and Centerville Middle School was one of those schools. Churchill Elementary School, we currently have a, uh, a new fire alarm being installed there. That work is going on during the nighttime and on weekends when students aren't present. We did get approved by the county commissioners to install a pre-K playground, which we're uh, very excited about. Um, if you're facing school, it'll be to the right side of it. And then to the left side of it, we're also taking that playground and moving it up towards where the blacktop is. There's some runoff and drainage issues there. So we're hoping to start on the playground sometime this fall. Kennard Elementary School. I will let Mr. Barricklow take the lead on this one. Okay, at Kennard, um, similar to the uh, other project that Mr. Pender mentioned, we did um, install a walk-in freezer and walk-in refrigerator to that facility. Um, along with new serving lines, ice machine, and milk cooler. 
Um, also, in addition to the work in the cafeteria area, we are in, in the progress um, of completing our single point entry system, which basically is a secure vestibule. Um, it will route all visitors after being screened at the exterior door. It will basically funnel all all access through a side corridor um, and directly into the main office where they could be further screened, sign in and, and, and meet with staff there before basically having full access to the school. The secondary doors that uh, were there are still there. What we're going to do is install uh, panic hardware exit devices on those doors that will be locked throughout the school uh, school day so that if anybody does come in and tries to come in through the normal access through those doors, those doors would be locked throughout the day. Uh, in addition to uh, the office work, um, or in addition to the vestibule, we've kind of reconfigured the uh, the main office, the uh, workroom that was to the back, and the uh, nurses area. We've pretty much almost doubled the size of the existing nurse space there in hopes of bringing in a uh, chop tank for the community health uh, services there. Uh, one of the pictures that you see on the screen right now is the uh, is the green reception counter. Uh, it kind of looks out of place right now because it really is out of place right now. Um, uh, within a few, well, well within a, probably this weekend coming up, it will be relaminated with a uh, maple front and a uh, maroon countertop to kind of tie in with the rest of the school. It'll, it'll blend with what we have in the media center for that school. Um, you can also see in one of the other pictures, the picture to the far right, is the new workroom area and the relocated mailboxes. Um, in addition to the work in the main office, we also uh, painted all of the corridors, all of the classrooms. We painted the uh, main office space, media center, gymnasium, and uh, cafeteria. Uh, we also picked up a few storage rooms. Did I miss anything? No, sounds great. Okay. Um, also, in addition to the painting, uh, we installed, uh, we took down the old chalkboards that were on the main instructional wall. We installed uh, a large uh, marker board and a 65 inch clear touch. We installed 31 of those through, well, we're in the process of installing 31. We're about 50% of the way through that installation right now. And we've got a little bit of concrete work that was done outside as well. Um, that brings us up to the end of. And I did want to give on. one shout out to the maintenance department. We did not receive the whiteboards until that Thursday before school started. And within two days, they had 62 of them in the school ready to go. So I uh, really give them a, a plug for, for helping us out. At Ken Island Elementary School, uh, <clears throat> we're trying to do away with carpet as much as possible. We really do not have a lot in the schools. Um, a lot of the high traffic areas, like to the picture up there, um, is the main office. And uh, we went with a planking system uh, that we do not have to wax. It's more user friendly and, and maintenance free. Ken Island Elementary, the whole entire school uh, was painted um, this past summer, you know, including the hallways, classrooms, storage areas, along with, with the gymnasium. Along with that, uh, yes, along with that, uh, the uh, the main front wing of the school that basically is from the main admin area and towards, um, uh, what is that, Main Street? Yes. The main Street there at the front. That section of roof was torn off completely and redone over this summer with a, uh, with a new roofing system. That project uh, started... Uh, a little bit before, um, well, right around Easter break, it started briefly over that period of time. Um, they pulled off the project because students came back in and remobilized um, in June after, uh, after school let out for summer break. Um, pretty much did a, did a great job over, over the summer break, installed that, got it all completed before kids were back, and that project is now 100% complete. At Ken Allen High School, um, as one of our student board members mentioned, we were able to um, install three new portables. Uh, that, those installations, I mean, that's 
was a lot of work involved in that, including you know running the the fire alarm systems, the telephone systems, the electric, um, installing the sidewalks. But as you look at them, they're uh, they're very nice inside. Um, one of the pictures doesn't quite show you, but there's a nice storage area in that also. Um, that move from Mattapique ninth grade annex to the high school was was a, a major move this summer. It took a lot of time, um, but I, I thought it went very well. Um, you know, moving the entire school um, out there. Hopefully, the students are you know enjoying that being at one location. Okay. Um, the Kent Island High School roof project. Um, this was a, a very big endeavor. Um, the project is still ongoing. Um, it's uh, percentage wise, it's about 90 to 95 percent complete. The project was originally planned to be a two summer project. Uh, the first summer was going to be uh, all of the flat areas were going to be done over the first summer and then the uh, contractor was going to demobilize, come back the following summer, uh, uh, which would be next summer, and complete the rest of the job, which would be all of the sloped areas. Um, through careful planning on their part and a very cooperative principal down there, um, we were able to um, uh, basically finish both summers worth of work uh, beginning in June and they'll be wrapping up about the end of this month um, the the work that they're doing now they're basically working uh, in the evenings after 3 30 4 o'clock in the afternoon until it gets dark out and they 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 are they're doing a really great job out there with that with that scope and uh, the benefit of that, of doing that over the one summer is, is we, yeah, we do have a little bit of an inconvenience with, with traffic and, and that sort of thing um, through September. But uh, the nice part about it is, is that we won't have any issues with, with summer activities with, related to a roof next, next summer. Also at, at Ken Island High School, uh, similar to the, uh, uh, the, the um, Centerville Middle School project, we installed a cell phone booster system at that school. Um, we did classroom modifications for the ninth grade. Um, and as the, the student member mentioned, the stormwater management ponds, um, a lot of the vegetation around the perimeter of that uh, has been cleared. Um, that will allow greater access for any type of school activities with outdoor classroom and 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 uh, those sorts of events that project is still still underway um, the remaining work that you'll see on that project uh, the biggest change that you'll see probably is going to visually happen this weekend they're going to start taking down the chain link fence at the pond that's furthest from the, the stadium so it's the the pond that's on the as you're facing the front school to be the pond that's on the left hand side that pond they'll take down the chain link fence and they're going to be putting up a three rail uh, three rail split rail system similar to uh, what was at the Mattapique complex where you have a three rail system and a um, uh, like a cattle type fencing, galvanized fencing on the interior of that. Um, the, and that'll, that'll basically occur at both, both of the ponds. Once they, they finish the first one, they'll move on to the second one. Um, the storm drains, uh, we had a lot of storm drain failures on that project. Um, and it was, it was, it was a really good coincidence that we were working on the roof at the same time that we were doing the stormwater drain repairs because the two kind of worked in, in concert with one another to solve some issues that we had inside the school with um, roof leaders that were backing up and causing some flooding when we had major rain events. So we were able to kind of kind of cure a couple of different problems that, that have been plaguing that school for some time. Um, in conjunction with the uh, underground stormwater drainage lines that were installed, um, I'm not sure if anybody was familiar with it or had noticed it before, we had um, patrons would buy uh, the little brick pavers that you would get a student name, um, whether it's a memorial or a patron type of uh, purchase. Um, they were kind of just haphazardly kind of placed along the sides of the uh, gymnasium entrance sidewalk. Well, we, uh, we came up with a design to, um, instead of pouring concrete back 
across to where we had to channel across for some underground uh, storm lines, we, we took the opportunity to basically take those pavers, integrate them into the sidewalk so that now as you're entering the school from, uh, from the parking lot going in towards the, the gymnasium entrance, you've got much more. It, it, it's a very nice visual uh, presentation there for, for bringing that kind of to the forefront and people recognizing it and seeing it. At Queen Anne's County High School, we were able to uh, mill and overlay the entire parking lot um, on all four sides of the school. We were also able to do a lot of sidewalk work um, in conjunction with making it ADA compliant. Uh, the, the one major benefit um, of this project, we were actually able to install 13 additional parking spots for students, um, which kind of puts us at a maximum spot there. So. Uh, we were able to, to pull that off and again, you know, with the uh, cooperation of the principal and, and helping us move different events around, we were able to keep that project going because as you can tell, a lot of the concrete work is at the main entrances. So uh, we appreciate Mr. Schreckengast uh, working with us. We were also able to um, put in a new track this past summer. So it is uh, equivalent to the same track that is at uh, uh, Ken Allen uh, High School. Uh, we still had to stay with the six lanes. We couldn't get eight lanes in there without moving the, the bleachers and the stadium um, and all that. But um, we're very fortunate because we're able to change it from yardage to metrics. So that will enable us to have uh, track events at that uh, school more frequently. Looking through there, you can see a single point entry. It's, it's not quite finished. We're still working on it. We have some um, access controls to put in. But as you know, if previously you would walk right into the lobby of Queen Anne's County High School and you could go anywhere you want. Now you're, you'll be funneled into the front office. Um, we're actually even installing a window to the side. You can slide to just, if somebody leaves their lunchbox, you just pass that through. They don't even have to come into the building. Right. Um, again, cell phone boosters were installed. Um, concrete sidewalks replaced. Uh, if you get on the main hallway, we replaced all the lighting with LED. They have a new career center there that um, were also painted and did some work on. And then a couple of the bathroom floors have a port in place. We, we ripped those out and redid those um, uh, with a new material that is more durable and will last longer. Stevensville Middle School, we are currently installing that booster system um, in the evening. That will be the fourth school completed. And then again, next year we'll do four more. Sellersville Elementary School, the new fire alarm is being uh, installed there. And then this October, we will be replacing the chiller, which is very much of a need of replacement. Um, we've gotten our, our money out of that project also. Um, Queen Anne's County Transportation Department, the warehouse where the maintenance is also at, um, one of the things that we kept hearing year after year was that there wasn't enough bathrooms out there. We were able to add two additional bathrooms to give them three bathrooms. Uh, the maintenance department did most of this work. Um, along with, we were able to add um, some training rooms to the uh, office out to the warehouse for the uh, transportation department. We installed a uh, new pump grinder. Um, the A phone was installed, and then we were also able to do through Delmarva rebate program uh, exterior LED lighting. So now that you can really see out there uh, of what is uh, you know occurring, I did want to say you know thank you to, to Daryl, Jim O'Donnell, and his crew, um, Mr. David Carter, and all the custodians, um, but also thank you to the county commissioners and um, and Todd Mon, the county administrator, for for helping us with a lot of these projects. Like I said, a lot of them were also grant funded. Um, and so we try to, to get the money where we can and, and make things happen. Any questions? No, no, I'm just impressed with how much you guys did. I, mm -hmm. Did you even take a day off? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, no. <laughs> but they look great. I mean, we've been privileged, you know, you know, grateful enough to be able to go and see some of this uh, new stuff that's been done and it looks fantastic. But, yeah. It was much needed. It takes a team. I mean, it really does. Uh, I mean, with the principal and then there's always something going on at a high school, you know, and summer school's going on. So I mean, there's a lot of coordination before we even get started. But it was a long, lengthy summer, but it was it was well worth it. You got, you got yeah, I, I thank you guys. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. And like one thing I see on here, three new portals at Ken Island. What's, what's said too, I think we 
now have a rise out of portables, so we our students are out of eight portables. Correct. So to me, that's mm -hmm. a negative of five portables we're no longer using for students. Right. Right. And the other thing is, it's I think sometimes a misconception, and Dr. Shellens, maybe you can answer this. Our schools aren't over capacity as far as students. It's programs and curriculum that cause us to have space issues sometimes. That's correct. Yeah. So it's not, you know, we Penn Island is about 2% over this year. Okay. Um, but that has, it was last year too. It's just because cause that is their home base. So just because we moved the kids didn't make it over capacity. They were already, Pretty. they've been over capacity basically since the day that they were open. But then some Penn Island comes up to Queen Anne's for a seat. At so many come up. So, I many mean, come I, up. So that, that's, what, that's why there's portables there at Queen Anne's County High School, not because Queen Anne's County High School is over enrolled. It's because we have programming there that's only service, that services two schools at one location. And there were quite a few safety features and security issues taken care of. And I, Mr. Uh, Sabori will, you know, go over those when uh, we have our um, open forum for that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, yeah. did not include this in there, but there were quite a few done. I think I got a copy of your projects for this summer were 38, and I'm just looking down here, eight or more were security related mm -hmm. as far as, you know, upgrading right. phones, best reviews and stuff like that. Uh, plus a couple roofs. I mean, I, I don't understand how you got Ken Allen done. That's pretty, I mean, that's, I give kudos to both you and the contractors mm -hmm. because to do that whole roof in a summer, whew, that's, bit. That's, I go by every Saturday and they're working. They are. Every Saturday. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been an amazing project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Comments? Questions? Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. 6.02, gender gap data discussion. Dr. Kibler, Dr. Sprankle. President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, and executive team members. For the record, I am Dr. Marcia Sprinkle. And I'm Dr. Matthew Kibler. Great. Thank you so much. So just to give a little bit of background information, um, the board had requested that we take a closer look at our gender gap. And so as a result of that, the regional Educational Laboratory of Mid-Atlantic was sought out. They're also known as Realm Mid-Atlantic. This is an organization that supports the learning of students in the district, also due to gender gaps. They do a lot of research. They have experts on the team, educational experts. As a matter of fact, when I had my, spent my tenure at the Maryland State Department of Education, we had many projects that were ongoing with the realm of Mid-Atlantic. So I'm aware of their work. Um, they are experts at what they do. They do a lot of coaching. They provide a lot of resources. They give a lot of recommendations. And so that's what we actually secured here in Queen Anne's County, which is great. Um, just to move on from there, they did find and they confirmed that there was a gender gap, which is not unique to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. It's a global issue, okay? It's a global concern. And it's also a state concern. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind in Queen Anne's County Public Schools is that because we are one of the top performing school districts, and I, I'd venture to say we should be very proud of that. Um, we're number five or lower. That gap tends to look larger because we're already performing up here. However, if we were not performing up here they get, and we were performing lower, that gap would decrease and be smaller. So that is what they've said to us specifically. Sure, I just wanted to point out um, the, the two pieces of data that are displayed in, in the 
gender gap memo. First, um, there's a couple graphs just on our MCAP data, English and math scores. They're just pulling out, uh, I believe it was our most recent scores from last year. They're only looking at Queen Anne's County. And I'd like to say we, we wouldn't be necessarily satisfied with where our students are in all those categories. Some of them, especially with math, are, um, you know, lead us to want more. But again, what Dr. Sprankle said, keep that in perspective. My office has given a presentation to you last spring on us compared to the entire state where we are consistently at the top five of counties in our performance. That is not displayed in those graphs. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. And then you also see graphs in here that um, that are only showing our gender gap relative to the other Eastern Shore counties and the state of Maryland as a whole. And while there are areas where our gap might be a little bit larger than other districts, please keep in mind that that is not showing that, that's not showing our overall scores, where if you still went back to showing us compared to the whole state, we're outperforming many in the state. Again, we're in the top five. So I just wanna keep that in perspective because that, to me, when I first read it, I think that's lost when you're reading there. It's, it's only looking at us um, at us by ourselves. And then when it compares us to others, you're only looking at the differences between male and females, not looking at the overall scores. If they extrapolated that to the, to the overall achievement, we would still be higher than others. Again, not trying to take away from the fact that there is a global gender gap issue just wanted to bring a little context because i know at first read it, it's a little hard to understand it was for all of us when we first saw it so as a result of that we are looking at what it is we can do to help close that gender gap and so we have added some strategies and some things put some things in place that will hopefully close that gender gap and so I just wanted to share a few things today. Um, as you know, that all of our kids here in Queen Anne's County receive tier one instruction. And because of your support and your pushing of this concern in regards to the gender gap, just like to talk about the fact that we've added a new reading program in pre-K this year, which is called Frog Street. It's a thematic approach, okay? Specifically, in grades K to five, we've also implemented interreading, which has eight actual components or elements of reading. And those, some of those components include <coughs> phonemic awareness. It, it includes uh, phon um, phonics, comprehension, writing, building knowledge, language, and vocabulary. Also, um, we have the iReady diagnostic assessments that we actually have in place as well. The iReady diagnostic assessments, they actually assess students and they target the skills in which there are gaps. And then from there, we go into tier one, tier two instruction, where we have small group instruction and sometimes individualized instruction. In math, we have what is called those pathways in iReady, which are also a part of tier two instruction as well. We also have foundations, which is a tier two instruction um, piece that we actually use as well that helps support those learning gaps of small, small children. And so those are the pieces that we have in place with that. You know that foundations is intensive, it's intensive phonemic awareness as well as word study. Just wanna make sure I don't miss anything. We also have mentoring, which is another recommendation that was given to us by Realm um, Mid-Atlantic. Um, the local management board has provided us with a grant in which we have a staff member on board. Um, it's her, title happens to be Achievement Mentor to mentor students. Also, we have partnered with the Mariners Dream Alliance organization in which referrals are made to our counselors within our building to support students as far as mentoring is concerning, concerned. Also, we have high impact tutoring. We're fortunate enough to be blessed with MSDE providing funding 
through the blueprint and the federal government funds through the American Res Rescue Plan. So we have that in place. We have one-on-one -on -one tutoring as well as small group tutoring. We have increased, of course, we're always, Dr. Noel and his team are always trying to reach for the most qualified candidates to be before our students. That's taking place and he's continuing to work with the team, also work with the administrators within the building to make sure we're securing the best. And so those are the pieces that we have. So that's what we have at this point. Anybody got any questions? Well, one question I have is on page six, and you addressed it very eloquently as far as it doesn't help us. I mean, it's good that we're a very high performing top five school in the state, but when you get certain numbers, it it screws them a little bit because you know you're dealing with a different apple, not as a whole. And that was a that we're, concerned me when I read that. But then when you explain it to me, it makes it makes sense. So, so on, on page four, for example, there's a chart: Queen Anne's County MCAP ELA rates. Yes, sir. English language arts, right? For by gender, 2022, and I understand 2022 results were sort of, I hope, an anomaly because of COVID, right? Um, but if you look at seventh grade, eighth grade, 10th grade, I'm looking at a 28% spread between female and, and male. I'm not sure if that's, if I'm reading that correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, eighth grade, 72% of our uh, female eighth graders were performing at proficiency, right? 72% and 42% of our boys. So what you're saying is, because we don't, we're not a big school system, that this gap is actually, what, mitigated somehow, or it's not accurate? No, I was not saying that. What I wanted to make sure was clear from this is that we are only looking at Queen Anne's data, and um, if you compare us to other districts, you will see that we're still outperforming the oh, state right, right. in general. Yeah, but outperforming is not really the concern. The concern is, how are our boys in Queen Anne's County doing compared to the girls? So, you know, obviously there, you've taken some steps. Um, I suppose before this, we actually requested that you look into this. Um, the bl blueprint's got some uh, solutions, I guess, up their sleeve uh, with tutoring and that sort of thing, funding. But still the gap is there. I, I'm not sure you know, whether you compare it to other states or, or globally or, or whatever. And even though we are a top performing school in the state and we've recognized that uh, nationwide, depending on what area you're looking at, we're, you know, we're, we're still in the middle on the curve, somewhere around 25, you probably know that. Mm -hmm. um, in a nation that, you know, worldwide, we're struggling to keep in the top third. So my concern really is what can we do at this level, and I know that you know resources are limited and funding and all that. Uh, I do know that there's training available, teacher training, how to actually teach boys and that kind of thing. We've done it with the uh, the race gap. Um, now we've got a, a huge gender gap, obviously, and uh, and so obviously I'm not a professional either. None of us on the board are. You guys are, um, but I would like to call attention to this, and if there's some way we can add some other programs. For example, bringing in kids early, you know, pre-K, three years old now, we're bringing them in, four years old. I was always taught, and I've talked to professionals, that if you try to teach boys to read at that age, because boys and girls are different, and they learn differently, and their maturity levels sort of do this as they get older. You know, boys are more mature at some point, girls are more mature. If you try to teach them how to read and write at that young age, they're gonna get frustrated. So right away, they're having a very bad experience with school. Now, again, you guys are the professionals. Um, I do know that we've got someone on our, fortunately, on our uh, committee, um, the local, what do we call it? The CAC. Citizen, mm -hmm. yes. Citizens Advisory Council. Committee, thank you, um, who I've spoken with, who is actually published author and, and that kind of thing in this area. That, that's his expertise. So I'm glad we've got him on the, on the council. I don't know if he's, you know, contributed or not in that regard, but so I, I think it is a, an issue that I think we should take a, a better look at. Obviously, I'm not going to come up with solutions here, but I would like to, as a board, come to a consensus that we would like our school system to see what we can do 
to raise our boys' achievement. Now, what we don't want to do, and what we always want to avoid is take away the achievement that our girls have made over the last five, six decades, because we know that their achievements historically prior to 1990, 1980 were, were low. So we don't want to take away. We don't want to do that with any of the gaps that we entertain or, or try to, to remedy. So how do we bring the boys' achievement up without bringing our girls down? But, but there is a problem, you know, and... Um, well, and it is, I mean, in Queen Anne's County, it's in the it's in the English area because it's sort of flipped in math. Math is right. Math is a little different. So, so. It, it's not it's not everywhere. No, you're right. That's true. And I'm not sure about science. And maybe uh, boys are a little lower in science. I'm not sure. I know we are primarily just... female oriented teachers, or mo mostly female. Does that thing play some of the factor that I mean, I go into some of these schools and I see very few male teachers. That was, especially in the lower levels. That was one of the recommendations. Yeah, that, that was one of the recommendations, um, which we're continuing to work <clears throat> on actually retaining and obtaining highly qualified personnel to stand before our students. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we try to do. And that's a, that's a very fine line to maneuver because you've got EEOC and everything else, laws that you've got to consider. Um, so, you know, obviously trying to attract more male teachers probably into the profession in general, mm -hmm. which is not exactly our, you know, purview or whatever as here, but... Um, I was really interested in reading about the single gender classes um, that you guys had, had, as, had part as mitigating this, <clears throat> this gap, as well as the... Um, oh, shoot, you had it even after that. You had to start boys' education later. Mm -hmm. um, those, I mean, I found it great... The, that seems to totally address it to have the classes. I mean, it, they said they've done it legally without legal challenges in other places. Um, and I know you guys said that you were going to be exploring the potential benefits more. And I'm just wondering what, what are we gonna do exactly to um, explore that potential bonus or? I don't believe that, I just, we did, this was not our memo. That was yeah. one of the s suggestions from region four i don't think that yes. either of us right were and they, they both have legal exposure to them um and i think could be very challenging certainly if we did um just exclude and just have all boys in one classroom it would have to be voluntary well there was a whole and, bunch of yeah you know i mean and then then it. i feel like we really would be exposing ourselves to well if we're going to have just boys then why don't we just have high achieving girls or no. why don't we just have it's yeah, the, so the segregation I think that could thing be is sticky a lot. No, I, it's I don't, you know, I don't support that at all. Um, but I'll give you an example. When it comes to, uh, well, prior to joining the board, I reviewed six secondary novels that the school board had uh, purchased for ELA in the various uh, grades, and five out of six had female protagonists, in you know, in the story. And there were other books that we purchased too. Um, just an ex as an example that you could tailor classes and I don't know what the resources are and everything else, something you may want to look into, tailor ELA, ELA classes um, that are geared toward more toward boy subjects. And if girls want to join in those classes, great. If boys, more boys want to join in it, fine. So you're not segregating, but the subject matter, I suppose the subject matter or the protagonist using the example that I gave, um, would be more oriented toward male subjects. And of course, we'll have, or interests, I should say. Um, and of course, we've got a balance with the, with the females and you know that, that sort of thing, the boys and the girls. Um, so anyway, just thoughts that, again, I, I'd like to see a, a little more thorough, maybe consult and get some ideas from the CAC um, and from the professionals that we do have on that board um, on things that we can do. We, obviously, sure. we've got this report. Um, you know, I, some of these are, are great in theory, getting more male teachers as mentors, you know, role models for the boys. Um, and, uh, but as far as segregation and that kind of thing goes. Well, that is one of the um, uh, programs that our expert on the CAC actually recommended when you and I met with him um, was uh, classes that would cater to just the boys. Right, um, and that's been... doing it still legally, but um, the one the thing is 
well, it's a problem, but I'm not, it doesn't, it's not necessarily an overwhelming problem. Um, I did notice that when I was at Grayson Elementary, they've got those, what is it, dudes in schools? Dudes um, in schools. Yes, mm -hmm. that might be uh, There's a, a good couple resource. Elementary schools that yeah, does that. State, but that's where Fathers. I really talk to them that they might be willing to, uh, you know, do some reading or have an after school class or something with strong male protagonists. Sure. <laughs> so, and uh, we, I, my office is preparing as, as state data comes out for last year, preparing to make a presentation to the board on last year's MCAP results. So we can, and we could actually look at how this gap has changed from this data to, to the next right. year too and see. I mean, the English graph that you pointed out, we have two years that are overwhelming. And it would be interesting to see how that changes as those kids get older and the younger kids move forward too. And you know, they referenced uh, in this report, they referenced the Maryland uh, study. They call it the Black Boys Study mm -hmm. about bringing up, raising achievement of, of uh, African American male students. Um, you know, this would obviously, or any initiative that we do in the county would obviously include them. And hopefully if, if we can raise male achievement, then all races are gonna be, you know, brought up. Um, and actually, Maryland, or that study, I think Dr. Kane was on that uh, panel, uh, recommended bifurcating or segregating students, male, female, you know, all male classes and that kind of thing. But um, so all I can do as a board member is to try to get just a consensus and we don't have to do it now or whatever but something that we need to look into, if we could put an emphasis on this. And that's one of the beauties of having a decentralized school system. You know, all our county systems have a lot of leeway with curriculum and everything like that. And I know that's trying to be amended, uh, so we're all in the same curriculum. But, you know, we can try something here, and if it works, if we see progress after so many years, and maybe we won't see any progress for eight years, the way the school system's tiered, um, then other school systems can look at us and say, hey, what did you guys do? You closed your gender gap, but you didn't bring down your female achievement when you did it. Um, on the same token, can we look at other schools in Maryland? Have, have any other Maryland schools closed their district or their achievement gap, gender gap, um, or other states? And Ms. Bennett was mentioning Connecticut. Well, she was mentioning segregating classes, and Connecticut has done this. I don't know if they've had legal issues or not, but apparently they've had some systems in Connecticut uh, have done this and have shown results. So, again, I'm not an expert, but I can read and I can research. And, um, and I think this is something that is worthy of pursuing and looking into, mm -hmm. um, even if we do some pilot testing, you know, and see how it's recepted by the students and, and parents. So that's my 45 cents. We appreciate that. We thank you for I that. I appreciate your, thank you. what you've thank given you us, too. That. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Any more comments or questions? No, thank you. Okay. What's next on the list here? I think we go into action items now, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mr. Stokes, Queen Anne's County High School overnight field trip. They were so patient. FFA. Yeah. Woo! There to go. There to go. I love their jackets. All right. Very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alyssa Crosley, and I'm the president of the Queens County FFA chapter. Uh, we are here tonight to ask for your guys' permission to go to the FFA National Convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, from October 31st to November 4th. Uh, we have 12 members planning on going, and we are planning on staying in a hotel in downtown Indianapolis, which is within walking distance to the convention center. Um, we have all of our members that are planning on going are all excited to go and have this opportunity to meet with um, leaders and have op different opportunities in the agriculture industry. Hello, my name is Madison Branham, and I'm the secretary of our FFA chapter. And throughout the convention, there are multiple different colleges and businesses that have informational booths set up that will allow students to look into new futures in the agriculture industry and look how to pursue them. Hi, my name is Michael Carroll. I'm the second vice president of the FFA chapter. 
along with FFA offering colleges and other trade schools there, we also do a day of service, which we go out into the Indianapolis community and do some type of service to the community, maybe picking up trash on the side of a road <coughs> or maybe clearing out a uh, par park's pond. Along with that, the FFA National Convention also offers leadership classes during it which teaches leadership skills while also working together as a group with people with different backgrounds. Excellent. Well, it's nice to see you all again. Yes. And uh, any questions or concerns? No, no concerns at all. The one question, you said 12. There's 20 going, 12 female and 8 males. Is that what I understand? Um, no, there's 12 students together, and then um, there's 8 adults going on the trip. Oh, 8 adults. Okay. Mm -hmm. They still do livestock judging. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Comments? Nope. Okay. Mr. President, I recommend that we allow up to 15 ninth through 12th grade Quinnans County FFA students to participate in the National FFA Convention to be held in Indianapolis, Indiana from 1031 to 11 4. The cost is approximately $20,000. Budget source will be Queen Anne's County High School FFA account. All right, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs> it says it up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, human resources substitute bus driver report. Can I? Get a motion for that. We Move reviewed that. Move to in. approve the um, HR report as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Now, I think uh, at this point, we yeah, come on up. Yep, we were going to uh, <laughs> schedule this for a vote. We amended the agenda earlier. <clears throat> Good evening, President Chipinelli, Dr. Salins. Board members and members of the executive team. For the record, my name is Jolene Smith. I'm the supervisor of special education. I bring before you this evening a request for tuition uh, to be paid to the St. Elizabeth School in the amount of $135,866.99. Okay, board members, have you had a time to review? Yes. This, any questions? No. Mr. President, I move that we approve a non-public tuition for student attendance at St. Elizabeth School in the amount of $135,866.99. Budget source is unrestricted operating budget. Second. All right, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Um, aye. I'm going to stay here. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> so I also bring before you this evening um, a request for a contract approval to supplemental health care. Uh, this is for a speech therapist. This is a full-time speech pathologist uh, to be providing services five days a week at Centerville Elementary School um, in the amount of $141,750. Question, the question I have is mm -hmm. we have two of them on our agenda. We do. One's five days, one three days. But when I break it down, there's a discrepancy and I guess each contract's different? Correct. So each contracted provider, depending on the, the company that's providing the service that actually is the recruiting company and they find the, the therapist, there are different rates and mm -hmm. each company also has different overhead that's associated with their providers as well um, and that is often why you will see that discrepancy well we actually do we have three one is a tele just video. correct mm -hmm. so we have three speech yeah. and so we have 4.89 speech pathologists now on staff right correct um, and so with this um, with the with the one will make it six point five point eight how many are we rec needing thinking that we need that we can't this will make us fully staffed, and it actually correlates to our staffing plan that I presented back in June. Um, and if you actually, if you reference the staffing plan, you'll note on there that um, I, I really delineated which positions were FTEs versus which ones were contracted. Um, and I should have said this is actually, it is a budgeted item. So we anticipated this need going into this school year. Uh, so it is written into the budget. And it's 
within the scope of the budget line item. Other questions? Mr. President, I move to approve a contract for supplemental health care for speech therapy services. Second. All right, it, motion. Okay, well, in the amount of the hundred, sorry, I was a little slow. That's okay. Oh. Um, in the amount of $141,750 and budget sources unrestricted operating budget. Second. <laughs> All right, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, you got one more? So I also bring before you this evening a contract approval for eBear SLP LLC, which is again um, speech therapy service. This is for three days of speech therapy service delivered at um, one school in the amount of $76,000, which is also provided through the unrestricted budget um, line item. I said a couple questions. So one is, um, for it's talking about that 75% of their billed hours will be for direct services, but they could have up to 25% of their billing is just is not direct services. Correct. So uh, that is part of case management. So in addition to those direct services, there are consult services that are between the teacher as well as families, et cetera. Those are considered indirect services. Um, and then in addition to that, there are assessments, there are reports, there's IEP meetings, et cetera, and none of those constitute part of direct services. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Not for me. Okay. Um, Mr. President, I move to approve a contract for eBear SLP LLC for speech therapy services in the amount of $76,000 budget source unrestricted operating budget. Second. Okay, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And the last one I have for you this evening um, <laughs> is a contract approval through Sunbelt, also for speech therapy services. Uh, this is for a virtual service delivery model, three days to support our infant and toddler popula population. Um, so because infant and toddler services <laughs> are... <laughs> Often, de <laughs> often delivered in a natural environment and it's often done through a co-treatment model. It affords us the opportunity to provide these services virtually. Um, I will also add to that description the fact that it is extremely hard to find um, speech pathologists and really related service providers in general, especially those that are willing to come into the buildings today. Um, so the amount requested is $65,000, and this is fully funded through restricted funds. Um, it is a split funded grant funded position. Say it again twice. <laughs> just kidding. So when, when they're I meeting say it so many with times. The, the toddlers, they're just in front of the screen talking or interacting for an hour, hour and a half? Or? No, no, definitely not. So actually our infants and toddlers is more of a coaching model. So again, it's a co-treatment okay. model where there's a provider that's in the home okay. as well as the speech language pathologist that would be joining them virtually. Um, and then it, like I said, it's a coaching model. So it's a matter of you're coaching the family on skills and strategies that they can do when you're not there uh, because the frequency of the service is often different than when they're in the school building. Okay, thank you. Mr. President, I move to approve a contract for Sunbelt for speech therapy services in the amount of $65,000, budget source, restricted operating budget. Second. All right, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank Have you, nice Ms. Smith. Evening. Okay, that brings us to social media class action lawsuit. All right. So the board met with counsel and actually uh, prospective outside counsel and um, we're going to be not joining a, a lawsuit, um, a class action lawsuit, I should say. Uh, this is something a little more uh, atypical. We're joining a mass action uh, lawsuit, at least that's the intent. We need to vote on it. We're gonna vote on it tonight. And the action is against, it's actually going to be a federal court case against many of the uh, social media providers, the big ones, which include Meta, 
What are some of the other ones in there? Meta. I think it was TikTok. I think. Meta. TikTok. Meta. I remember that one. Yeah. Meta, Google, Snap, and ByteDance. And Instagram, Thank too. Thank you. All right. Well, I wrote all that down. <laughs> and I don't know where it went. Um, that's why we're getting a lawyer. But uh, so in any case, uh, it's because of the uh, ultimately the mental health issues that have uh, that teenagers, young people have uh, incurred uh, and have suffered from and how that, because that's been transferred over to the schools. The schools have, have uh, a higher demand for mental health and uh, uh, providers um, and professionals. And so that's sort of the basis for our standing to sue these, uh, these uh, providers. And it's based apparently on a algorithms or algorithms that these uh, uh, providers have developed that actually target young people. And I think that's uh, starting to come out more and more in the uh, open media uh, that how damaging it really is. And how addictive they're doing. And how addictive it is, right, exactly. And, um, you know, it, it's a modern day marketing tool and it's very aggressive and it's having uh, uh, mental effects on kids and that's being transferred over to in monetary terms uh, to the schools, obviously in other ways as well, um, distracting from learning and, and everything else. I mean, uh, I don't even know the extent of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware that it is uh, immensely damaging. So uh, the board did meet with council at the last work session, I think it was, closed session. And, um, and tonight we're gonna have a discussion that that's my opening piece if any of the other board members or mm -hmm. anyone has the superintendent has anything to well, say i certainly. just want to add in just because i you know trying to be fiscally responsible is that this is not going to cost anything that it, and different than a class action it's not as if the attorneys are taking 40 50 percent of the monies um i know dr salem was very good about explaining to us it was like the uh, tobacco industry when they had these suits come through that we were able to get this money this chunk of money that we use for education that we use for programming that is we're still getting money um, for programming from that and so this is gonna be the same thing and we're paying nothing even our attorney will be working with the outside attorneys and it um, but that all goes to the contingency um, for a lot less percentage than what class action would do so there really is no downside and I think we all believe that this is really happening to our children we believe it 199 percent so um, we just I we the board we've talked about I think it's a good thing mm -hmm. and I think most of us do yeah I, I think another issue he brought up was you know lead paints banned in 60 78 I'm sorry correct and that should have been done the same way this is being done yep. it's it, it's putting a burden on us as a school system <clears throat> to, to, to get these children up mm -hmm. that have been hurt and you know it's a liability that they've caused for themselves and I think it's a I think it's a good idea that we support this and join it anybody else Mr. President, I move to retain the Franz Law Group in California to represent on a contingency ba fee basis as plaintiffs in litigation against various social media companies to recover damages incurred as a result of the mental health epidemic among QACPS students. Um, it would, the fiscal amount is none, there it's a contingency fee based. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, next thing, 8.07, Time to Care Act. Dr. Michael Knoll. Good evening, Mr. President, Dr. Salins, members of the board and executive team. For the record, Michael Knoll, Director of Human Resources. I come before you tonight for approval for joining a, an alliance with MABE and MAKO for the Time to Care Act. Beginning in January, beginning on January 1st of 26, all organizations employing at least one person in Maryland must provide workers up to 12 weeks of job protected paid leave to care for themselves or certain family members who meet specific eligibility requirements. <coughs> An employer may satisfy the TCA or the Time to Care Act requirements through an equivalent private insurance plan or an EPIP consisting of employer provided benefits, insurance, or a combination of both if the plan is offered to all eligible employees 
and at least meets the rights, protections, and benefits provided to a covered employee. We ask tonight that Queen Anne's County Public Schools agrees that working with MABE and MAKO is the most cost efficient way to satisfy and meet the Time to Care Act. I had a question. So it says for the Time to Care Act, employer and employee is split 50-50. On here, the $10,000 is the employer's contribution. What would the employee's contributions be? According to this collaborative, if we go with uh, the EPIP, um, an employer that provides covered employees with an EPIP, which this would do, uh, those covered employees and the employer are exempt from the required contributions. That is one of the benefits of going with MABE, Mabe and MAKO. So they wouldn't have to pay? Correct. Okay. And all we would be paying is 10000 a year? Annually. And then MABE, Mabe would be our, and so when, our facilitator so for the, this. So, if I, so basically this is just our, the FEMLA, what used to be FEMLA, but now it's extended, uh, the 12 weeks of, are they still no, getting, This is, this this is, is separate from, yeah, they, okay. they, separate. FMLA so, is not going anywhere. This is, this is a new law for Maryland. So if we, get, if we do the 10000 a year, and let's say um, uh, I take off for the for caring for uh, one of my family members. I'm still getting all of my benefits from Queen Anne's County Public Schools, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And I'm not paying anything. I guess I'm not sure like where, like what is this private insurance plan? What's it doing? Cause I'm still getting all of my, I'm still getting my benefits from Queen Anne's County Public it's Schools. It's kind of, I mean, not? I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's as if we were self-insured, we'd have to take care of all that ourselves. But being in this collaborative brings all of our costs down because we have one person that's we have a, a better buying or vying or I don't know how to quite say it. We have more weight in the game right. because everybody's, you know, on They're going together. to provide a, the most cost effective cost way effective because right. strength in numbers is going to keep the exactly. cost down and that's for both the employers do. and well, the employees. I understand that except I'm thinking I'm still getting, they're not, they're not going to, this cooperative consortium is not going to help pay my salary right this is still all coming out of our budget everything right. that I've all of my benefits are still coming correct so how am I how am I saving money as a Queen Anne's County Public Schools by doing this like what am what's my what am I going to get as the the um, employee from this consortium that I'm not getting just kind of in general the, from the employees are still are going to get the paid leave so what we're paying annually and all the other counties that join this, which many of them are, that money that we're paying in is what is going to pay for those 12 weeks of leave that the employees are taking. I believe that is how the insurance program is going to work. In other words, for $10,000, one payment a year, we're going to be relieved of this obligation of paying this money if, if they qualify for it. That is what the consortium is, is hoping to do. And there's 24 school now, districts. Now, right? and something else that, that has to just be said. This is, this is hot off the press. I mean, this is something that was passed in 22, does not take effect until 26, but MABE is on behalf of Queen Anne's County and behalf of all the other counties that join them are going to apply with the Department of Labor so that we are in compliance with the Time to Care Act. So we had a speaker earlier that talked about this and had an objection to us doing it now as opposed to later help me understand why why would we not do this now why would we want to wait to do it later as requested earlier because you uh, in in my opinion you cannot wait to do something this monumental last minute right before there is a lot of planning and prep that goes into this also by joining the consortium now when we do we are not going to have to pay and employees are not going to have to start paying into it in 24. that is one of the benefits of going into this and who decided what, what did you say 2040 20, 20, 20, 20, i thought the 24 don't pay. 24. Right. employees or employers employers and employees okay but i thought that doesn't it's not costing the employees anything this should not 
cost the employees by joining that this MABE and MAKO will be the insurance provider for this lead. Uh, employers have three options. They can default to the state plan where they, you pay into it. Mm -hmm. The employees and the employers pay into it. They can self-administer the program, which is not cost effective at all because then we become our own insurer and it's, it's right. off the rails. Or you contract with an insurance group. That is what MABE and MAKO are going to do for us. They are going to be our insurance provider for this. We will be paying into that so that it is covered and our employees are covered. A prorated portion of their salary depending on the earnings that they make. And as the 24 entities join, those costs go down. That's what I was going to say. It's power and numbers. That's the right. bottom yes. line. We and could go out on our own and make it very difficult on ourselves. Plus, we're not the experts in this. We have a, they have a team of people that are working on this that Correct. made make it together. So, you know, they're bringing in the insurance experts and looking at stats and things like that. We don't have that capacity to do that here in the district. We, we just don't. Um, I mean, Michael's pretty much a, a one-person shop there. Um, but... You know, so you can't, we can't go out on our own and just do it. I don't think we have the capacity to do that. And, you know, it, it is, for me, <clears throat> in numbers, is the smartest thing to do. Um, we, we do this with a lot of other things. Um, you know, MABE serves, uh, uh, we do the ESMEC Trust, Energy Trust. We do ESMEC um, Insurance Pool. And so, you know, in numbers helps us with strength and weight of being able to, to handle situations. It's just like even with Everside, um, this, the same thing with that and being able, once we add additional partners to Everside, our costs, our costs are gonna go down. So it's, it's just, it's the sheer numbers that help us too. Um, but then you add in the expertise that we don't have. Um, that it, it's it's kind of like a no-brainer. And why do it now? Because there is actually a deadline of October 1. Okay. So any district that wants to participate needs to have their board approved by October 1. Uh, now, they did say that because, you know, this is new, that if somebody said, well, my board doesn't meet until October 5th or something, they said, absolutely. Um, but we need to make the commitment now or or one of the other two options, which I just don't think are viable options for us. When somebody applies for this, I'm assuming then they go to this group to see if they qualify. It's going to take the load off us as far as make who, who qualifies and who doesn't. Work. As our employees, we would collect all of the information and right. we, would, we would submit it to MABE and MAKO. And if they want to uh, appeal it or something, they'd appeal it to them, not this board. It would probably, we would facilitate <clears throat> the employees just like we do now with FMLA. Okay. So if we approve this tonight, then $10,000 goes to me for, for this coming year, I this guess, year. or to start up. And, uh, and we start debiting employee contributions at that point? Mm -hmm. We would not. There aren't any. Mm -hmm. there, oh, there aren't any. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I guess, and I'm sorry, I, I really am not trying to <laughs> not get it, but I'm not understanding if they're already getting the 12 weeks, if we're paying them and they're getting all of their benefits, I'm not sure why we need any, like, what's the insurance doing? Like what I, I guess I don't understand what this consortium is going to do for us. That this, we're this is, I think you're, you're conflicting this with FMLA, which is our already well, benefit. Well, no, I, I let go of the FMLA. Okay. It's just saying that they get to take 12 weeks and they're going to get, we're going to still be paying them and they're still getting their benefits, correct, from us. They would keep their benefits. Keep that their won't benefits. go away. Right. What they get is a, a prorated portion of their pay they don't get full okay, pay all right, all right. it's a prorated portion of their pay okay. so it'd be like 60 percent of their average, and average they're weekly wage or and depending on the income of the employee right, exactly and they're handling all the administrative stuff yes, so we're yes. Not, okay all right yes Okay. No, it's very so no, so this no is one very is going to get a hundred percent of their pay by yeah, doing right. this they're going like to get a prorated cut. based on yeah. but but i think what helen is saying is so we're paying this employee who's out for 12 weeks um 60 percent or whatever the percentage is of her average weekly wage mm -hmm. no matter what her salary is and then because we're in this consortium with mabe is mabe paying i mean is the insurance carrier that they contract with as a group of 24 are they helping defer some of those they costs? will defer the cost and the more that are in it the lower or the higher that deferment will be. Okay. I so see. the impact on the employer, which is Queen Anne's County, right. will be reduced. So because of the Maryland law, we're either 100% we're paying this employee or employees a percentage of their average weekly wage, or we're going to have join this consortium and they're going to help pay a percentage of whatever we have to pay right. that employee. Okay. 
And it is so very it's complicated. Bring the cost and in. as Dr. Knoll said, this is all new. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, navigating the Time to Care Act is all new for everyone. And I have to say that Maeve and Mako taking the lead has you know, given us kind of almost a sigh of relief because we knew we didn't have the capacity to, to do that. Right. Um, so we're very thankful for their leadership and, and again, just combing through the law and trying to figure it out together, just like the blueprint law has been very challenging to figure out. The Time to Care Act has been very challenging in too. I will not say I'm an expert in it, and I'm sure Michael would probably say the same thing at this point. I don't think there's anybody who's really an expert in it. So your questions are very valuable, and we appreciate them. And, oh, they're, they're great. And, and I'm sure they're not just happening in boardrooms. It's any employer that has one or more employees is, is having to navigate what this is going to look like for them. So your small businesses, your large businesses, right, right. this is going to be a very impactful uh, piece of legislation. And, and we'll continue to bring things back to the board and actually... You know, we could have um, Mr. Nagel come or one of the, one of the folks um, from Mabe or Mako come and 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 give a presentation. I'm sure they'd be happy if the board would would like mm -hmm. additional information. Uh, so this Are is we outside happy the school to facilitate system. that. And this is statewide. Oh, this is this uh, is everywhere. Industry wide, yeah, everywhere. everywhere, everywhere in the state of Maryland. We did attempt to to try to get schools excluded right. from it for obvious reasons sure. um, because it hurts kids. Mm -hmm. It, it does. Ultimately, this will hurt right. kids because they won't have a teacher that's qualified face to face with them. Um, so ultimately, you know, we we went on the basis that this is hurting kids and, and we should be excluded. But that didn't happen, um, obviously. So we're moving forward. We did get some timelines changed yes. to give us more time to digest it, to get made and make more time to figure out how we can kind of go about supporting each other, um, but did not did not get excluded. Excellent. Are we able to leave the consortium <clears throat> if we were to choose in the future? I mean, it's yes. just, it just says 10,000 annually like, for... Yeah, and that 10,000 is a ballpark, I'll be honest with you. That's a starting point. Maybe a little less as we get, depending on how many people really join. Right. Might be $1,000 more, just depend, you know. So okay. it is just kind of a ballpark, uh, a, 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 I think a good estimate. Um, but could could change slightly. And it, it is not a life <clears throat> commitment. It's a, it's a memorandum of agreement. Yeah, and we can separate if need to. And one other question. I'm sorry. I'm showing that in the, on the fiscal impact amount, it says ten thousand dollars annually, and TCA insurance is. So the, are those two separate things? So the no, there's there's an that's what Dr. Salen said. The the actual insurance fee has not been worked out worked yet out. because so they, they, are joining. Gotcha. they don't have right. the the yeah. totality of the <clears throat> counties that have. And, and Join. certainly by the end of October, we will know because, yes. as I said, the target date was October 1st, unless someone was like, oh, my board meeting's the first, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, can't get it approved yeah. until the 12th. Right. They're not going to exclude them from the opportunity. Right. So certainly by the end of October, I think they'll have a, a better understanding of how good that ballpark is. But mm -hmm. knowing the expertise that MAPES always come through, um, they do their homework. Um, they're very supportive um, to, to you all, as you well know, right. um, that I, I think that they wouldn't have put a number out there that they didn't feel confident was very close to the to the mount. Okay. All right, my bet's on 24 school systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, Montgomery County always kind of. Dr. Noah, yeah, so do the only employees ones. have to pay anything in connection with this MOU? The, um, as long as we are at EPIP, that is to ease the burden on the employees and the employers. So by but the page. Department of Labor is going to be the one that has to approve this and then they'll be the final say. So I'm just kind of bouncing off what Mrs. Bent said. If they don't have to pay anything, why was, why would there be an objection to us joining? I can't. She didn't speak. say there was an objection to them to us joining. She had an issue with the timeline, and whether we should do it now or oh, later. Well, that was what her she first said. part was that, that she, she doesn't didn't feel, want it. She didn't want it. I think that the that. And I don't know this because I just listened to her and I didn't know that she was going to speak. But if I had to guess that the union's stand is that they feel that we have to go to the table and negotiate with them and that mm -hmm. they're the ones who make the decision, not the board members sitting up here. Yeah, okay. And I would disagree with that because there are different things that you do have to negotiate and insurance is not one of those things that we negotiate. Right. Would you agree I, with that, I Dr. Noll? I would agree. So I, I believe that's their position. Um, but again, I have to, I didn't know they were coming. I didn't know they were speaking on that issue. But I make a motion to agree uh, with oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 you do negotiate insurance, like you negotiate 90 
yes. correct, but not the insurance carrier. They don't. They don't. They don't. Um, <clears throat> We don't negotiate that we are with uh, Blue Care First. Care First. It, it's not in the contract here? Which, which insurance carrier? Okay. So, any other questions? Okay, um, any other questions, comments? Mr. President, um, I move that we that QACPS would join the MABE and MACO Time to Care Act Collaborative. The fiscal amount is $10,000 annually and to CA insurance. Second. Okay, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Dr. Noll. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Noll. Okay. Dr. Sprankle, approval of uh, policy 620 materials of instruction. Good evening again. President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team members. The record, I am Dr. Marcia Sprankle. I bring for you, before you tonight policy 620, <coughs> materials of instruction. You may recall back in July, we had our first reading, and in August last month, we had our second reading. So tonight, we are bringing this before you for approval. To date, we don't have any additional comments, any additional phone calls. So. Okay, so obviously the superintendent is charged with creating policies, keeping them up to date. Uh, the school board is charged with that as well, you know, to approve policies that reflect the state uh, legislature's uh, statutes, uh, the COMAR, that's their regulations, Code of Maryland regulations, that are the rules that implement uh, Maryland's statutes approved by the, by the state uh, house or um, uh, state house, right? And this is materials of instruction, and it's got that word that if you haven't figured it out um, by now, I really have an issue with, and that's equity. But equity is in the Comar, and it is uh, part of the uh, the blueprint, actually. Um, all schools are mandated to have equitable outcomes by a certain date or show equitable outcomes in, in education uh, to implement educational equity. I've read about educational equity, equity in general, um, and you know it's a very vague word. I don't particularly like it in this scenario. Um, and I've talked to teachers, I've talked to principals in our own school system, and uh, there seems to be some you know com genuine uh, confusion what it really is. Uh, some are totally for it, um, some are not. Uh, some don't have an opinion, of course. Um, but I would just point out that this is, uh, you know, I've, I've reviewed this and it does conform with what we, our obligations in the Comar. So um, I really don't take issue with that. That's not our, our call. I, I think it's curious or ironic that we're scratching out on, on our update of this, we're scratching out multicultural education, which was you know, the, the last great thing um, in social justice movement was multiculturalism and multicultural education it started in the late eighties and the nineties. Um, I guess that didn't go anywhere. So now we're at educational equity. Um, so that's my two cents. If anybody's got any comments, I just hope that 20 years from now, we're not scratching out educational equity because that didn't work. Uh, didn't raise the achievement gap, didn't close the gender gap, socioeconomic gaps and all these other gaps. And now we're gonna be doing something else in, in 20 years and, and still spinning wheels. So that's my concern. Anybody else, comments, questions? Well, my only comment, and it has nothing to do with the, is to the, just the verbiage, is that says after that demonstrates education, educational <coughs> equity and assists students. It should have an S on the end of assist. Okay. That's all. Okay. The time I've spent being on board between the Thornton Commission, the Crowing Commission, and the Maryland Blueprint, I hate to tell you, Mark, things are gonna never, they never stop changing. <laughs> well, and I don't understand. It's not that I expected it. No, I understand. I mean, I just, I don't understand you. It's the best thing since thing. We got this going on, and all of a sudden, five years later, let's do something else. Hey, <clears throat> you know, we just need to get back to the basics and do things with common sense. Yep. As far as equity and what words we use, 
I don't know. I think Queenie is kind of does a good job, but I can tell you it's frustrating as hell sometimes. And I do realize that there are problems out there that educational equity is trying to fix. I, I just don't think that, uh, I guess like you feel, that's the way to go about it. Say now we but, need to make uh, a motion. Yes, I approve of President and, and Dick's, yes. Bigger yeah. issues. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions? None. Hearing none. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. President, I move to accept policy 620 materials of instruction as um, presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Sprinkle. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Okay, and then, oh, Mark uh, Dufendock, we've got approval of lease purchase agreement. And, oh, Lenovo Chromebooks. 8.09. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team, uh, Mark Dufendock, chief financial officer. Um, in June, the board had approved the procurement of 2,600 uh, Chromebooks for the high school students, uh, subject to lease financing. Uh, subsequent to that approval, there was a bid for the leasing vendor and the recommended award is to TD Equipment Finance, uh, which would be four annual payments of $354,692.38, uh, with the first payment being on July 28th, uh, 2024. Mr. Dufalak, I know that this has nothing to do because you're just presenting. Um, I guess after looking through this, I was, I don't think, and I must have missed it. I was not aware that we were paying $130,000 in finance fees um, for this lease. I was thinking that our the Chrome that people we were buying the Chromebooks from were just leasing it to us um, and letting us pay over time. <coughs> I, just to be fiscally responsible here and or cheap, I am that. So we did vote on that. That was the what 1.287. And I did question the prices because if you look at the 2,600 units, we are paying, they're not wholesale prices, they're retail, retail prices. And I mean, just for instance, if you go on and look, we could, we could go onto the Lenovo website and buy those protective cases for $20,000 less than what that DALI used to charge us. So I'm just questioning, we took bids for the um, lease agreement from four different companies. Why aren't we taking bids to see if we could save more money yeah. For the Chromebook. Well, so, so I will tell you from an IT standpoint, you're getting a Chromebook that's fully loaded to the when our students get those Chromebooks, they open them up, they log in, they go to work. What you buy off of a website is a blank screen or a blank system that you have to set up. To it it takes a minute to set up 2600 laptops. You have to have the security system. You have to have the hard, the all of the information that the students need to log in, nobody's going to do that for you for free. Well, I bought it's, that same computer for. But yours, you cannot bring yours to this school system. Open it up, log in, get all of your homework, reach all of your teachers, do all the stuff that you need to do in this system for that laptop that you bought. Okay. Well, now the ones that the they 20, got delivered the to $20, us. twenty thousand dollars extra for cases. I mean, just right there alone. I mean, if we. Took it's a cost of doing business. Nobody is going to give you twenty six hundred dollars to anybody. If you work in a multi, I work for an IT company, of, right? We buy thousands of laptops every year. When you get them, all you have to do is put in your information and log in. You can reach all your networks. You can reach all of your hardware. You can reach all of your share drives. You can reach all the applications that your company owns and can use. That's what this is. Okay, so These what is the very... harm in taking bids? We either get a higher bid, we get no bids, or we get lower than what we are piggybacking off this. And sooner or later, consortium. you get what you pay for. There's also called sparing. When they break, there's somebody there to fix them. That you, you have, have that an with IT other person. Companies, though. <laughs> you're not. You're not going to get quality systems. We are giving expensive hardware to children. Yes, five hundred dollars. Children per that drop them on the <laughs> bus, throw them in a closet, open them up, sit them down, beat on them. You want 
quality systems that we don't have to spend all of our time trying to fix and replace. I'm talking about putting out a bid for exactly what we have written down in here. We have four-year warranty, $36. We have four-year accidental damage, an extra 80. Chrome OS management console, an extra 30. A protective case, $27. White glove service, $23. Uh, which is essentially shipping, and the computer itself is 299 That's $495 per Chromebook. So, Correct. So can we take this number, all these things that you want in this system, and put it out to bid? And either we're going to get no bids, we're going to get lower bids, or higher, and then we could just go with this. If I mean, I don't understand what the harm in trying to get a better number and being fiscally timing. responsible. Some of it is timing wise, yes. um, that approval was already made to the right. vendor. The Chromebooks are already in place. So this is just the financing aspect. Okay, of that well purchase. then my next question would be back on June 7th when we approved this, it says right in there that we could have went with a four year contract and used HP Enterprises <coughs> and we could have went with four payments of $350,000 over four years, which was one was 1.4 million. So now why didn't we go with that? And now we're choosing to go with the TD and that's gonna cost us an extra 16,000. My understanding the is they, years. they provided an estimate, but it was not an official um, proposal. It, well, it um, said in there, if we went with that by August 31st, that was the price it would have been. So I'm just trying to be fiscally responsible here with the taxpayer's money. And I mean, if I could go on the Lenovo website, I'm just talking about cases here sure. and save $20,000 on 2,600 cases. That's a lot of money just for cases. So what else are we missing out on? Well, I, I wish that Josh was here because I think he could answer your questions better um, because he's the one who does the ordering and looking and comparing costs and looking at the educational discounts we get. And certainly I can connect him with you and make sure that your questions are answered. I think at this point, you know, there was obviously a huge lapse in that um, connection with the financing company. And, and I'll be honest, that's a staffing issue that we had at the time. And um, so from the time that, that it was approved by the board, it was dropped. And so by the time that um, Dr. Um, Doofendock, try to say your name right, <laughs> came on board, we were like, where, where are the Chromebooks? Why are they not here? Oh, well, the leasing hadn't been completed for the financing part of it. So he's had to go back to the drawing board. And when you did the, 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 the um, better pricing for... Yeah, it was, it was in process. The it, prior CFO had put out the bid um, prior to my arrival. So I can only speak to it from that point right. forward. It didn't get finalized before... Right, it was not finalized. B ...before they left Queen Anne's County. So there was a lapse in there. And unfortunately, he was trying to catch up. So all said and done, it ended up changing. So they've actually been approved by you already. This is just for the financing piece. And it was pushed a year, which is costing us more money. And that was also done by a previous decision of someone who's not here anymore. Well, what, I mean, <laughs> one of the major concerns I got, not that we don't need these things, but I'm worried about our budget this year and next year. Mm -hmm. And we're committing $354,000 for the next four years, starting 24, which is not just current budget, mm -hmm. but it's a following budget. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we're going to be sitting here in January and February when we finalize our budget, and we're going to sit there and say, okay, what do we need? We got this to cover, this to cover, this to cover. We've committed half the hay in the barn, and we still haven't got the horse ready. I mean, not that we can change this right now, but man, I tell you, I understand your twenty thousand dollars, but I got higher numbers than that to worry about. I well, think. I'm we just got saying as that as a case. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if we go up, what? I mean, can I, we? Take, I, yeah. Make a motion to take bids. Go back and take bids they, for the. They've, they've already, they've been, already been, been See, we've already just fired. Fired. Or, Yeah, they've already been ordered. They're already That's, in use. Right. To my knowledge. Yeah, they've already been. This is just. Yes, the, this is just so to did, pay for them. How did we pay for, how do we because get Because we're systems? leasing, we're leasing them. So we have a commitment to say, we. it's just like when you lease anything, you're, you're gonna get your car, but you haven't paid for your car yet. You're gonna end up making monthly payments or annual payments to Never pay for pay that for car. It. Right, <laughs> and then you pay <laughs> extra. So you're borrowing the money to pay for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, going forward, can we see for more things that are put out to bid because 
I mean, we piggyback off the Education Enterprise Consortium, but how do we know they're getting their best bang for the buck? Right. I mean, we hope they are, but what if we put it out to bid and we save two or three hundred thousand dollars? We don't know unless we try. Yeah, and There's and no it, harm. it's and to be honest with you, it is challenging in a smaller district to be able to put everything out to bid, and we do have to really count on some of those bigger districts: Montgomery <coughs> County, PG County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Baltimore. Um, um, city and county because they do have departments that do all the hard work and the heavy lifting for going out and beating feet to be able to get those best prices and then that affords us the opportunity to piggyback off of them because they do have the the um, wherewithal and and you know the means to go out and do that um, there are lots of things that we do take out to bid um, but when we see something like that we you know and we know that it's been properly done through a different school district we do take the opportunity to piggyback it's 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 like that for anything matter of fact like our Everside contract that we did we now have several districts that are piggybacking off it was a hard heavy lift that we did to get that into the place it is and now all these other districts are going to be able to reap the benefit of that so that's how we look at it point well taken though and I appreciate that um, but I, I do think that we can't put everything out to bed, but can we look at additional things? We sure can try. We also too, um, you know, when I, I think about some of the things that Mr. Pinder does in his department, sometimes there's just not anybody out there to, you know, there's only one company within a hundred mile radius that does that work. And so we can't always um, find other, you know, three people that are gonna come to the table to provide us with a viable, um, you know, solution. Um, usually, you know, and sometimes in his field, as I said, it's one. I mean, am I correct, Mr. Pinder? Correct. Yeah. Yes, so, but again, point well taken, and um, we certainly will continue to look at opportunities where we can put things out. But right now, yeah. what's on the table is not necessarily these Chromebooks. They're with us. The, the, what's on the table right now is the leasing um, contract so that we can pay for them. Well, that's another thing. Why are we buying things if we don't have the money for them? So, I mean. <laughs> because after four years with these children, you need to replace you, them. Yeah, I, I, you just, and, and we're actually trying to squeeze out more. Like, I know. With, with the cases that we do buy, we're, you know, we're looking at the software that we do put on them to ensure, and, and having that high level where they touch the, the, the Chromebooks that, and we don't, I mean, our technology department does not have the capacity to touch every single Chromebook no, and don't. set it up. And I mean, it's, it, a lot of it, work. It, it's a lot of work. <laughs> It's a lot of work to set them up and maintain them. So, if we had 15 more people in that department, I would say absolutely, we should be. We need we a should have experts have that, that can fix more. them in district, and you know, but we don't have that capacity to do that, unfortunately. And there's one other Our thing looming. that I'd like to add as well: we have to have reliable devices for testing, as well. Yeah, yeah, Good we point. have to. Yeah, you know, because um, you can you could actually get a violation. Well, I so mean, if we put it out to bid, who knows? Maybe we could have bought 5,000 Chromebooks instead of 2,600. You know, we don't know unless we try. So, I mean, if we can but save money one the where bid. we can That's increase the, the quantity. This is just, unfortunately, this is the cleanup of what was done previously. They were put out to bids. When were they put out so to bid? It was off a of consortium. Uh, it was off the consortium. Yeah, but, but somebody put it out to bed. It didn't well, just like her. We didn't. We just approved the from the piggyback. All right. So it's a valid concern, and uh, I think our financial woes that uh, Mr. Smith reminds us of, <laughs> <laughs> rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are, are seated elsewhere, but. In any case, these are here. We got to entertain this motion or this contract. So, do we have a motion? <coughs> oh my gosh. Mr. Sorry. President, I move to approve the lease financing of 2600 Lenovo Chromebooks for high school students in the fiscal impact dollar amount of $1,418,769.53. Budget source FY25 unrestricted operating budget. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And you know what? Thanks for stepping in to and, what you did. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, do we have an, anyone signed up for citizen comment participation? All right. And in that case, future meetings, uh, September 20th is going to be our normal work session. Starts at 5 p.m. And school safety uh, meeting, um, it, it's a panel. I believe it's going to be televised, right? Is that going to be televised? So, right? Here. Yeah, it's going to follow right after the uh, board the meeting. meeting. Right. And oh, at 6.30. All right. Okay. Any other uh, comments, concerns, issues? All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. Got a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, everybody.